Great. It is, uh, it is going. Mm -hmm. But now, where the hell am I in the Zoom? I think everything is active, isn't it? Yeah, but I can't see the Zoom. Let me let me see what it is. Oh, this is this is the uh... okay. Now I'm back on the Zoom. Okay, this vacation didn't help for my uh, skills on Zoom and YouTube, but we're back online. And we have 19 participants. Welcome back to the monsoon uh, webinar. And we're starting with the boss, uh, my friend and my buddy for field work for many years, Peter Clift. So that's a really, really good start. Uh, welcome back from vacation. I need to say uh, a few words, an announcement that if you have students, colleagues, and uh, passerbys that are interested to present in the monsoon seminar and they have a degree or going for a degree, please let them know. The seminar has already a long queue of people waiting to present in the next year and we're pleased to announce that they will, it will continue into the next year. And it's been a joy for the first year, first semester to, uh, or first half a year to see what people are doing and keep in touch and keep the community running. So at the end of this, you can type your questions in the chat or you can ask them directly and uh, we'll see what we get. Now, I don't think Peter has, is in need for any presentation, but he's a foremost monsoon scientist and that's one of, of only one of his qualities. He brings together what I like uh, myself the most is brings together knowledge from so many facets of geology to put them together. So it's a, it's a always, I'm always fascinated to hear what he's talking about. So no more presentation, Peter, you, let, you have just the nicest background, that's good and uh, you can take over. Very good, sorry. Good, so let me see, see if I can. Uh... Oops, now that disappeared, I'm sorry. As you say, we're not used to doing this for a little bit now. Let's try this and hopefully, how does that look? Can you all hear, see that? I see something. You see the introduction slide? Yes. Great, then let's, con let's commence. So, right, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the evolution of the Asian monsoon and its impact on erosion tectonics, particularly in the Western Himalayas in the Indus Basin. And some of this involves work done by my former students, uh, particularly Tara Janelle, now at the University of Glasgow, uh, Yu Ting Lee in the University of North Texas, and Peng Zhou at North Kentucky University. So we all know what the monsoon is in this group. We know that it's this uh, seasonal climate in Asia and particularly featuring heavy rainfall in the Western Ghats and of course along the, Him the front of the Himalaya, <clears throat> as well as in Southeast Asia and Southern China and parts of East Asia as well, Northeast Asia. And of course the monsoon reflects this reversal of circulation patterns uh, in Asia, as opposed to the normal Hadley circulation, where we have the heating on the equator and the dry air subsiding in the mid-latitudes. In Asia, we have a reversal of this in the summertime, where we have the heating in the mid-latitudes and, and the descending air in the equatorial regions. And for many years, 
uh, it has been suggested that it is particularly this um, um, heating over the Tibetan plateau, uh, like so, which is the critical feature, you know, the idea that the warm air on the plateau uh, is um, rises as a result of the, the sun's heating of the surface, and that this generates a low pressure system. And of course, we now know that potentially, at least in the South Asian monsoon, that potentially the height of the Himalaya themselves is maybe the critical feature and that the heating is in fact over the um, Himalayan foreland basin, the Indo-Gangetic plain in particular. And I'll come back to how the, the tectonics may have affected that process uh, later in the talk. Of course, <clears throat> it's not just um, orogenic topography which is controlling the height of the, uh, the strength of the monsoon. Uh, we also know that from modeling studies that potentially the, uh, the shrinkage of this um, so-called Paratethys Ocean, which dominated the area in Central Asia back in the Oligocene, that as this contracted, uh, it, it allowed the land to heat to a much greater extent than when it was covered in shallow seas, and that this also helped to intensify <clears throat> the monsoon system. And this little, this little green bed here is in the Western Tarim Basin. That's the last marine bed in the Tarim Basin before the Paratethys um, retreated. So what do we know uh, about the monsoon's history? Of course, we know, have known for a long time using things like the stable isotopes up here in the Potwa Plateau uh, region um, in northern Pakistan that, that we saw using carbon and oxygen isotopes from um, paleosols and um, calcretes like this, uh, that we saw this change in isotopic character that is related to the, um, the rainfall and particularly in terms of the carbon, of course, in terms of the vegetation, this split from woody dominated C3 vegetation into a more C4 dominated uh, field here. Um, and although we now know that this is not, um, doesn't happen at the same time everywhere in the Eastern Himalayan foreland basin, we know that there is no transition at all. Um, but in the Northwest Himalaya, this is starting somewhere around 8 million years ago. And of course that correlated with um, with marine records, particularly initially this data that Dick Crone and his colleagues produced following the drilling offshore the Oman margin. Could you mute yourselves? Thank you. So the this abundance of globigerina globigerina beloides that we saw in the Arabian Sea. there i need sound thank you um so yes this increase in globigerina beloides that's related to summer upwelling this this little white uh, sign here is the is a view of blooming um plankton offshore the arabian peninsula in the modern day in the summer and it was the increase in this uh, that, that uh, suggested to us that the monsoon may be getting stronger at about eight. And this was also correlating with data that was produced in the South China Sea, as well as in the North Pacific, again, related to wind as much as anything, not really rain related, up, upwelling related. So recently, there's been some uh, revision of that view. Um, Anil Gupta has shown us that the onset of the strong upwelling was starting more like 13 million years ago um, and then strengthened again around eight. And work done um, in the uh, Maldives um, by IODP, Christian Betzler and colleagues, uh, Gregor Ebley, uh, we're, we're looking at the carbonate platform in the Maldives. And as you can see, this giant uh, drift deposit, which you can see begins to build up after about 13. So the suggestion was, that the monsoon maybe strengthens at around 13 and then maybe again around eight. But of course, this in, if we really believe these models of tectonic climate coupling, then this should relate somewhat to the development of the mountain belt, right? Uh, 
So particularly this um, model, uh, the so-called channel flow model for the Himalayas, which intimately connects the tectonics of the mountains with the development of the monsoon. So in this particular model, the deep buried rocks of the greater Himalayan sequence are brought to the surface uh, by thrusting along the main central thrust and of course um, a, essentially a low angle normal fault south Tibet detachment. And it was this focused erosion along the southern flank of the, Him of the Tibetan plateau which allows the material to move to the surface. Uh, this is the, the, the same sequence that we see here. This is in Manali in northwest India. So in theory, the strength of the monsoon rains which dominate the erosion pattern here should be closely linked. The issue here is, of course, that the, monsoon, the, the Great Himalayas we know begin to form around 23 million years ago, and the main central thrust stops moving about 17 million years ago. So that's all rather older than anything I just showed you about monsoon history. So this was one of the inspirations we had to look at monsoon chemical weathering records as being a proxy or at least linked to the development of the monsoon climate. And in the South China Sea, uh, offshore of the Pearl River Delta, uh, I, I used a chemical weathering proxy. This is a spectrally derived thing um, that essentially means stronger chemical weathering at the top and weaker chemical weathering at the bottom. And so, which generally more chemical weathering being associated with more monsoonal conditions and so the idea is that the monsoon would have got stronger starting in the beginning of the early Miocene, reaching a peak in the middle Miocene and then decreasing. So if there was anything going on in the late Miocene, it wasn't strengthening, it would have been a weakening of the monsoon. And of course, that doesn't mean necessarily that the earlier proxies are incorrect. Uh, the upwelling record, for instance, is driven by wind, not by rainfall, whereas chemical weathering would be more strongly related to humidity in the continental interior. And that is interesting then to note the similarity between the Chinese record and that in the Arabian Sea. So again, maximum chemical weathering in the middle Miocene and then a decrease then towards the present day, less chemical weathering with drier climate. And to a certain extent, we see something like this in the Bay of Bengal, where there's a change here. You can see this drop here in um, uh, potassium aluminum ratios here in the late Miocene. And these, uh, these records of chemical weathering correlate somewhat with the history of erosion, where we see mass uh, accumulation being at a maximum in the middle Miocene, uh, increasing in the early Miocene and then decreasing. So again, more erosion during times of strong monsoon and less during times of weak summer monsoon. And we would expect that then to correlate with the, with the exhumation uh, of the Greater Himalaya. And in fact, it sort of does correlate somewhat with that, where if we look, include foreland basin sediments, as well as bedrock data in the dark green here, we see an increase in erosion, in exhumation cooling rates during the early Miocene, a couple of peaks in the middle Miocene, and then a decrease. So it does look like the strength of the monsoon is relating there to the formation of the greater Himalaya. Uh, so this begs the question, of course, well, that's all very well, but in this case, why does the monsoon become stronger at the beginning of the early Miocene? The collision between India and Asia is a bit controversial, but I guess most people think it happened sometime in the Eocene, maybe 50 or even 60 million years ago. So if that's the case, why does the monsoon take 25 million years to start being strong? Uh, of course, we have seen records from people like Alexis Licht earlier on in these seminars that suggest that the monsoon was active early on, and that still remains an interesting and controversial viewpoint. Uh, but I think we all agree that things get stronger in the Miocene. So why is that? Um, well, it's possible that the, that the steady growth of the Tibetan plateau was reaching a critical threshold at that time. Uh, one alternative um, I looked at with my colleague Alex Webb at the University of Hong Kong was the idea of progressive tearing of the Indian lithosphere. So in this diagram, you see the Indian plates subducting here below uh, the Tibetan plateau, which we show, which we don't show here, it's in, invisible, 
And the idea is that the slab is tearing both from the eastern and the western syntaxis. And there's some evidence to support this, both in the progressive younging of alkalic magmatism in the Tibetan plateau from the eastern and western syntaxes and youngest in the middle, essentially where the break off occurs, as well as um, in, in the timing of motion on the faults, younging to, towards the center of the origin, as well as the timing of pressure and of maximum pressures and temperatures uh, that young from the syntaxes towards the center. And so the concept would be that as you tear, as this slab breaks off and the Indian lithosphere rebounds, that this allows the high ranges of the Himalayas to rise up. And as I mentioned earlier from the model of Booz and Kong, that this, um, this rising of the Himalayan barrier would have intensified the Asian monsoon. So in this model, it's a solid earth tectonic activity which strengthens the monsoon but then that feeds back on the erosion of the mountains themselves and helps the greater Himalayas to come to the surface. We see this in the Foreland Basin record, for example, looking at material from the Shualix and to older sequences with a variety of names along the belt. And when we looked at uh, detrital zircon and argon argon muscovite ages, you can see that the oldest ages, this is color coded for longitude. What you could see is that the youngest ages are, tend to be these blue colors, the dark blue here in zircon, uh, but more light blue in argon. So that would be like 83 degrees. So essentially around the central part of the Himalaya here. So this would be the youngest part of the erosion. And whereas the strongest erosion uh, in the syntax in the syntaxes, particularly the red, the Western syntaxes, Nangaparbat, would be older. You see the peak ages in Argon are much older here in the syntaxes than they are in the center. And this suggests that the mountains themselves are uplifting and eroding asynchronously, partly driven by this tearing of the slab. So we can investigate this a little bit more if we look at the record in the marine realm. And that is, of course, the point of IODP Expedition 355, as well as the earlier 354 in the Bay of Bengal. Um, in order to do that, in order to interpret the deep sea record, however, we need to think a little bit about how sediment goes from the mountains. This is Dharamsala in Northwest India. Uh, how sediment comes from these high ranges, starting off as very big class indeed in the Foreland Basin, and of course, eventually making their way to the Arabian Sea into the Indus Submarine Canyon. So we know that this transport of sediment from source to sink is not entirely simple. We know that in the big river gorges in the Himalayas, this is work from Bodo Buchhagen um, in the Sutledge River Valley, and what Bodo showed us uh, using um, cosmogenic and uh, I think OSL as well, but certainly cosmogenic dating, is he showed that the, the, the Sutledge Valley was filling up with sediment during times of a strong monsoon when the sediment load was high, and then it becomes incised when the, when the monsoon gets weaker. So we end up with this flight of terraces. But the idea, here is that the, that the valleys might store significant amounts of sediment here during wet times and that it then gets reactivated and removed in dry times, potentially spanning thousands of years. Uh, likewise, uh, in the Foreland Basin, um, Liviu and myself looked and, and several colleagues uh, looked at the incision of the Foreland Basin. Here, the orange here shows you where the Indus and its tributaries used to incise the foreland, uh, do incise the foreland basin, uh, as they do in the western parts of the Ganges system. And we were able to show that the penny planes in between this um, date to about 10,000 years ago. So again, there is storage of sediment there deposited up to 10,000 years ago, and then recycling of that material uh, in the present day and over the last 10,000 years, at least into the lower reaches of the river and potentially offshore. Further north, uh, Tara Janelle, who can't be with us here today, 
uh, was working on the uh, the Zanskar basin north of the the High Himalayan front, and she also dated uh, mapped and dated terraces here, particularly in the central Zanskar basin, and also showed essentially storage during the wet periods up until about eight, 10,000 years ago, and then incision, quite significant incision in some of these big fluvial basins. So there appears to be a buffering, at least in the mountains and in the upper part of the floodplain there that prevents sediment going directly from source to sink. Of course, once the sediment arrives at the river, at the river mouth, the, the journey is not finished. It then has to go through the submarine canyon. Uh, and we know uh, from a series of cores that were taken down the canyon, partly by a Dutch cruise uh, some years ago and about 12 years ago now by a cruise that Liv, you and I uh, did in the Arabian Sea. <clears throat> we were able to core the canyon along its length. And what this showed is that there was actually continued sedimentation in quite deep water in the canyon. So here at about a kilometer of water depth, we see continued sedimentation uh, here as well as at the delta. Uh, even though the lower region at the bottom in the upper part of the submarine fan, there is a break in classic sedimentation that stops about 10,000 years ago. So the sea level rise, the post-glacial sea level rise does cut off sediment flux to the deep ocean, but it doesn't stop it going into the submarine canyon. Uh, moreover, we know something about where this sediment is coming from. If you look at the figure on the, on the right here, a plot of strontium against neodymium isotopes. And what you see is apart from uh, rivers draining the Bella Ophiolite, that's towards the west of the Indus river mouth, but if we just concentrate on the Indus itself, you can see that the more recently, in the last uh, 8,000 years, the Indus has had relatively high strontium values, uh, whereas uh, in the initial deglacial times and the glacial in uh, the last glacial maximum, the Indus had lower strontium isotope values. And the sediments that we see in the submarine canyon, which are these yellow stars, you see they all plot up here pretty much on top of the uh, Holocene River. And what that means is, is that the mud, uh, the fine grained sediments being deposited in the canyon are being transported there essentially in real time. So we can imagine sediment being flushed out of the Indus River mouth and advected potentially as, as fine grained turbidites, but probably as hyperpignal plumes that fall out here and uh, deposit material into the submarine canyon where it can then be reworked further down. We don't see a lot of reworking of older sediments. Now, what's the interesting contrast, at least not during the Holocene. Now, what's interesting then is to contrast this with sand. So when we look, trying to look at the sand compositions using zircon, in this figure on the left, uh, you can see that we've divided up the zircon populations on the basis of their um, ages, uh, potentially linked to uh, source regions, particularly the blue colors are related to Himalayan sources, whereas the yellow reflects more Karakoram sources in the north of this basin. So what's interesting to note here is that the river itself is quite dynamic, that um, 10,000, 7,000 years ago, we had quite a lot of material from the Karakoram relative to what we see in the present day. You see that little yellow slice has become quite small. So in this plot, uh, the distance offshore is from left to right, and the time is in the vertical axis. So the Indus River has become essentially more Himalayan since about 10,000 years ago. Uh, and that may is probably related to changes in the pattern of erosion. It's becoming more Himalayan because that's where the strong rains are falling. So what's interesting to note, however, is when we compare this these sand materials with those in the submarine canyon, there's actually quite a significant discrepancy. So uh, the material in the canyon doesn't actually, the sandy material in the canyon does not look like the river mouth. So while the, the mud and the silt, fine silt, they do look similar between the delta and the canyon, but that's not true for the sand. So it looks like 
sand being delivered by the Indus Delta is, is essentially piling up in clinoforms here in front of the river mouth, uh, at least and at least during the Holocene. But presumably this has to be reworked later. So if we think about the total budget of sediment uh, during the uh, Holocene the, um, for the Indus River, we come up with a little um, diagram like this that was published early this year in Earth Science Reviews by myself and Tara Chanel. So what we suggest is that um, the material reaching the lower reaches of the river is going into a series of depot centers uh, that Livy and I uh, highlighted some years ago now. In the alluvial plain in southern Sind, in the delta, and then into these major shelf clinoforms, with only a very small proportion going into the Indus Canyon and essentially nothing onto the Indus fan. Now, most of that sediment is probably coming out of fresh bedrock erosion and in the reactivation, reworking of moraines, glacial moraines. It turns out that all these river terraces and things like rock slides, mass wasting deposits are volumetrically essentially insignificant compared to the total flux. The only place that makes a big difference is potentially the floodplains. They generate about 11% of the total flux. And there's a slight, an unknown but potentially significant contribution in and out of the tar desert. Uh, which the Indus River flows past on the way to its, the ocean. But if you want to be very simplistic, you could say that most of the sediment is being deposited either just onshore or just offshore, and that most of that is coming out of the bedrocks and the glacial moraines. And this is during the Holocene when the monsoon is strong. When we look at the glacial times, however, of course, the situation is very different. This is when the monsoon is weak. So at this point, the alluvial plain and the delta and these clinoforms are all being incised and eroded. And so at that point, they are contributing significant amounts of sediment in, into the total flux. And of course, at, this is the point when the Indus submarine fan is actually being supplied. So uh, during the glacial times, 93% of the sediment entering the ocean is ending up in the Indus fan. Uh, a little bit is going onto the slope and the shelf, but most of it into the submarine fan. And a lot of this is being reworked. Now, remember, all of these deposits accrete during the Holocene, during, or at least during the interglacial time. So that means that the glacial era sediments that are deposited in the deep Arabian Sea are actually mostly eroded during the previous interglacial. So your turbidite might be 20,000 years old, but the, the, the grains that comprise your 20,000 year old turbidite may actually have only been eroded maybe even 100,000 years before that. But there's a significant lag there as a result of the strong erosion caused by the interglacial monsoon and because of the sea level effect. So we can't, that means that the erosional signal in the fan is always offset from the, from the climatic forcing on shore. And let's bear that in mind then when we begin to look at the long-term record. So let's do that. Let's go and look at the deep uh, Arabian Sea, as you know, because the thickest part of the, of the fan is near the coast, thinning offshore. And in 1990, sorry, 2015, um, we drilled the uh, Indus fan, not in this proximal location, unfortunately, uh, but we did drill it in its eastern part here in the Laxmi Basin offshore the Indian margin. Um, the, uh, in two sites on the flank in the middle of Laxmi Basin and one here, 1457 on the edge of Laxmi Ridge. Um, this was generally a good sequence. The major issue was that we ended up drilling on top of a very large mass wasting deposit that had come out of the Maharashtra part of the margin here and been redeposited. You can see it a little bit on this seismic profile, this rather pale looking feature here. So what this meant was that the older part of the sequence, older than 11 million, was mostly wiped away by this mass wasting event. 
But nonetheless, it does give us a pretty good record going back to around 11 million years ago. There are some hiatuses here, um, but broadly speaking, we are spanning this interesting late Miocene period uh, when the monsoon upwelling was uh, increasing in the Oman margin. So now we have the chance to see what effect that has on the Northwest Himalayas. So we look a little bit about chemical weathering records first. Uh, it's interesting to note, of course, that in a dry climate compared to a wet climate, we get different types of clay minerals, different types of chemical weathering occur, generally more chemical weathering in the wetter climates and these materials are then reworked and redeposited, and we can look at them in the core that we re recovered. So this is a rather confusing plot, I apologize. Essentially chemical proxies on the left and clay related proxies on the right. And they are all, at least in theory, related to the intensity of chemical weathering. And what I want to point out to you is that most of them are decreasing, especially during the late Miocene. Things like the illite crystallinity or the kaolinite illite chloride are going down quite significantly here. Um, it's harder to show with the, uh, with the bulk sediment chemistry. Uh, you'll see that actually the near shore industrial well, Indus Marine A1, is offset. Uh, if you look at the IODP sites, they also decrease through time. Um, and uh, certainly at uh, Indus Marine A1, we see a, a decrease through time. So in general, we see weaker chemical weathering at the time when the vegetation on shore was becoming more grass-like, probably because it's getting drier. It is interesting to note that the chemical weathering in the Indus is generally stronger than that which we see in the Bay of Bengal, which is maybe the opposite of what you would expect. So here, this is a plant from uh, originally based on one by, um, uh, oh goodness, um, Christian Franz Nord and um, Martin Lucca. Uh, and what they show, they're using this uh, sil uh, potassium silica and aluminum silica plant here. And essentially the slope on this plot is telling you something about the intensity of chemical weathering. And it's interesting to note that the Indus is actually more chemically weathered on average than it, the equivalent material in the Bengal fan, which is maybe the opposite of what you might have expected, because the Bengal system is generally wetter, and we have been associating wetter conditions with stronger monsoon. Maybe what this really tells us is that the transport of sediment in the Bengal system is fast and doesn't give time for the sediment to be strongly weathered, whereas in the Indus, things are going more slowly because it's drier and that the more chemical weathering occurs. But this was an interesting and unexpected result. Speaking of chemical weathering, I want to quickly summarize the result of uh, a small study that Tara Janelle and I did in the Arabian Sea, offshore the Mekong and the Pearl system, uh, published in geophysical research letters earlier this year. And we use these records. This is the um, IODP site, the Blacksmi Basin site at the bottom. And we had similar records and the, of course, the Pearl uh, River and the um, 1433 here in the southwest South China Sea, probably mostly from the Mekong. And these are, this is the chemical index of alteration. So we would expect, um, well, I don't know what we would expect, but they are basically going down, this one's pretty flat, this one's very noisy, but basically going down. And what we were interested in doing was testing this hypothesis from Maureen Ramo and Bill Ruddiman that it was stronger erosion of the Himalaya, which might be driving the cooling of the earth in the, in the Cenozoic. So we don't have a full Cenozoic record, but we do have about 16 million years of record, so mostly the middle Miocene to present. The reason we pick these three is not only because we have chemical weathering records, but we also have estimates for the amount of sediment deposited. So those little black lines show you seismic data that we were able to use to construct a, uh, an erosion budget. And when you put the two things together, you get this type of result. So what we see here is um, the efficiency in consuming CO2 uh, per kilogram of rock. Uh, and you can see uh, 
we tried to do this in two different ways. One by adjusting the by assuming that there was an upper continental crust source here and making a few adjustments uh, which were required uh, essentially. Uh, or we could use bedrock data from the GeoRock database um, from the Max Planck Institute in Mainz. Uh, this gives the difference. This suggests actually the Pearl River is the most efficient, which is a bit different from this upper one. But what you'll notice is that all of these remain fairly flat, right? So it's not we're not getting more efficient weathering through time. It's the same, generally speaking. And when we combine that with the mass in each of these submarine fans, we end up with this, the total rate of CO2 consumption. Maybe not surprisingly, the Indus is the biggest because, well, the Indus has more sediment than the others. So it has a bigger uh, consumption of CO2. What's interesting is that this is going down through time and the Southeast, Southeast Asian rivers are pretty flat. So what this suggests is that stronger chemical weathering, at least in these parts of the Himalaya and Tibet, is not causing the global cooling up because it should be going up, not down. The Indus is actually just going down through time. So whatever the, is doing the chemical weathering, it's not the Western Himalayas and it's not the eastern flank of the Tibetan Plateau. So let's think a little bit about where those sediments were coming from anyway. We can look at them with neodymium isotopes, uh, taking advantage of the fact that different parts of the Himalaya have very different uh, neodymium isotope compositions. Uh, and we can look at these both as a cross plot with the different sources and essentially um, a, a, a plot here that shows the clastic data, both from Indus Marine A1 and the IODP data in blue here. And um, what this shows is a, a, a fine tuning of um, an improvement on the model that I and Jörg Blustein published um, 15 years ago that essentially shows the Indus is becoming more epsilon neodymium negative uh, in the recent past. Uh, we had focused on 5 million years ago, but you can see that it essentially reads a, maxim or a maximum value here between about 10 and around 6, and that it then begins to decrease, especially after about 3 million, it becomes quite negative. We do believe that some of these um, sediments, uh, finer grain sediments may be washed off the Indian Peninsula and act as a noise to our record. If we exclude these, then the trend to more negative conditions in the last few million years becomes much more apparent. So that's essentially more Himalayan, but we can do better than that if we look at zircon. So the nice thing here is that the zircon uh, uranium lead ages in the different sources are quite distinctive. The lesser, especially the crystalline lesser Himalaya, have this very strong peak at about 1800 million years ago. The greater Antethian Himalayas are essentially indistinguishable at about 1 billion, and very young ages in the Karakoram and at Nangaparbat. So essentially, the plastic, the new sediments that we looked at, this is. Um, KDE diagram showing the age spectra. And if we just focus at the top here, this is the younger um, sediments, the selection of the sediments that we looked at in the Arabian Sea. I just want to point out a few things to you. First of all, that at 15 million years ago, for example, we see all of the sediments have got this young spike, so that all of them are coming from a river draining the Karakoram and Kohistan. We note that there's a little bit of older grains back here of Himalayan style. This is this pink particular, but you will notice that this pink population become more numerous up section. And particularly this, um, the green one of 500 million, which we mostly associate with Tethian Himalaya Hymanta units. The other thing to note is the appearance of this lesser Himalayan spike, which is very prominent in the river today. Uh, and you'll notice it really doesn't appear until about 2 million years ago in the zircons. So it looks like the lesser Himalayas, or at least the crystalline lesser Himalayas, don't really make a big impact on the total erosion until after 2 million years ago, which is quite recent, really. So we see that, or the, however, you can see the increasing Himalayan composition in the zircon 
correlating with what we saw in the neodymium. And that's shown a little bit here in this multi-dimensional scalar diagram where we see a progression uh, essentially towards more Himalayan compositions um, with, at the younger parts of the fan. Uh, so what does this mean? It means that the, that the blue here, these blue values here, um, represent Himalayan type zircons, that they're becoming more numerous, and that this is correlating with the drying of the, Himal of the monsoon climate and the slowing of erosion following the peak that we I was talking about earlier. Unfortunately, our uh, erosional record doesn't go back far enough to uh, look at this uh, in greater detail. This is where the record was removed by the mass wasting deposit. We can do some modeling of this. We tried some doing some unmixing of the, of the sediments uh, to actually define the basement end members. So again, the Tethian and Greater Himalayas are in blue, the Karakoram in green. And you can see this transformation essentially from a late Miocene fan, which is essentially Karakoram dominated into a much more Himalayan system now. And that correlates somewhat with the structural reconstructions from Alex Webb and friends, who actually show a relatively late breaching of the Greater Himalayan uh, slab and the Tethian, sorry, and the Lesser Himalaya, the crystalline Lesser Himalaya, uh, essentially after about five million years ago. We know that that's not true everywhere uh, or in detail, but it looks like when we look at the whole system, that there's a significant increase at that after that time. So just one last thing before I wrap up, and that is to think a little bit about Nanga Parbat and the Western Syntaxis. So this is because in the Eastern Syntaxis, we think about Namche Bawa playing a big role of dominating or at least having a big impact on the erosional flux. And we wondered if that might be the case here, that since the carapace of Nanga Parbat is Lesser Himalayan, maybe this increase in Lesser Himalaya is not is not the less Himalayas themselves, but actually the character, uh, actually Nangapava. So what we were able to do was we sampled the uh, rivers flowing off of the, the massif here, as well as looking at sediments upstream and downstream. So this is a plot, these are KDE diagrams. Um, uh, sorry, it's a little bit complicated, isn't it? They're, it's basically 3 billion years, and then the little diagrams show you just the last 300 million. So what I hope you can see is that upstream in places like Skardu in the Pakistani part of the Karakoram, the system is, the river is dominated by young peaks, particularly about 100 million and here at about 25 million. Uh, and when we look downstream um, at, uh, at Nangaparbat, at uh, Tato and Gorikot, these are the ones on, we do see that old peak, the Lesser Himalayan uh, peak here, as predicted. Uh, we, and we also see some younger peaks here at about 150 million years ago. So as it turns out, this um, we know that these, um, when we look further downstream again at Atok, which is downstream of all of this, it's the beginning of the floodplains, you'll notice that at Atok, there's very little Lesser Himalayan detritus. So this suggests that the, the, the old zircons we see in the fan are not coming from Nanga Parbat, they're really coming from the Lesser Himalayas. And this is confirmed when we look at um, rutile dating. So these are rutile ages. Uh, and again, what we can see here is that in the downstream parts of the trunk stream that we get, there's about essentially 10 million year old rutiles here. And we see the 10 million year old root tiles in uh, Skardu in the, in the Pakistani Karakoram, the Western Karakoram. We do not see them at Nangapalba. So Nangapalba, of course, is eroding and producing material, but just not very much. And this is our estimate essentially of this, particularly when we take into account the fertility of the sources in Nangapalba. So we thought about a quarter of the zircons at Atok were coming from Nangapaba, but in terms of the total sediment flux, it's almost insignificant. So uh, why is it so different from Nanche Bawa? I'm not really sure, but it may be something to do with the fact that it's a lot wetter at, Na at Nanche Bawa and a lot drier at Nangapaba. Uh, 
So I'm going to finish now. Let me just sum up. So I, what I hope I showed you was that the monsoon gets stronger after about 24 million, probably as a result of that tearing off of the Indian slab and the rising of the Himalayan barrier. We see that the long-term weathering rates in the Western Himalayas, at least, are actually decreasing, not going up, which is the opposite of what would be predicted by Ramo and Ruddiman. We do, however, know that the stronger rains increased erosion and are linked to the exhumation of the Greater Himalayas. But it's not clear how they relate to the later, the drying, how would the later drying relate, uh, reflect the exhumation of the lesser Himalayas. We know from the detrital record that we get more erosion after about six million years ago, and particularly after three million in the inner Lesser Himalaya. We know that that's not Nanga Parbat, it really is the Lesser Himalaya. And this late unroofing um, is consistent with the structural models, uh, and, but it does suggest that maybe um, climate is less important in the more recent past and that tectonics is dominating, that uplift of the, of the mountain chains, it may intensify a feedback, but we don't think the, Himalaya, the changes in the monsoon are dominating the erosion path at that point. Uh, so it's actually quite, uh, hard to establish an easy link between patterns and rates of erosion, uh, although the total amount of erosion does appear to be linked to Himalayan strength. And so I'm going to finish at this point, um, only to say that um, that if you like publishing papers on the monsoon, you might think about sending them to Geological Magazine, uh, which uh, it has an improving impact factor and an editor who looks kindly on monsoon papers. So I will be quiet at this point, And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try and address them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Fascinating, fascinating. It's getting more and more complex. Tectonics, climate. Yeah, I was hoping it was going to get easier. Yeah. Well, if you have questions, please type them or make a sign. Stunned. Yeah, it's shocking. I know. If any of you want to get reprints of that, uh, then I'm happy to send reprints of any of the papers I might have mentioned. Just send me an email. There's a question from Dick Crone. I cannot see it. Where do you see it? He's got his hand up. Oh, gotcha. Uh, Dick, I will unmute. You need to unmute him, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I can't unmute myself, apparently, somehow. <laughs> well, well, there were people that uh, came with dogs and kids, so I had to mute everybody. <laughs> well, thanks, Pete, for this interesting talk. It's, um, I think that the biggest problem we face is how to untangle global climate change from monsoon climate change, let's say. It's, it's, it looks like your chemical weathering records are basically following global climate. And, oh. and, and that's and right. That, uh, huh? I feel like it's the other way around. Yeah, that the, it's probably getting less weathering because it's getting colder and drier. Yeah, that's fine. But what has that to do with necessarily the monsoon? Well, essentially, it's the world is freezing in. Yeah, that's right. And presumably the monsoon in a well, the monsoon, um, the monsoon is just the Asian climate, isn't it, essentially? So the monsoon is changing along with the global climate. Well, that's the question. <laughs> is it really? And, and um, that's what I was hinting at my lecture too. Uh, at, you know, it, it, it's, it's confusing me too. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, and so uh, the question is, if the world is freezing in, what does it mean for the monsoon system? And um, if you look at the frontal systems driven by Antarctica and so on, you know, you might expect actually a stronger wind system when the world oh, freezes I, in. And that I, would explain the below it is records and, uh, and um, uh, in, 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 uh, so 
But what does it mean for the chemical weathering records? Weathering records is, is, is perhaps. I, I think know, it sort of follows. I mean, I think the wind and the rain appear to be doing different things. It's the only thing that makes any sense otherwise. The, I mean, like, as you said, the Beloides record or the wind record in the North Pacific, they don't make any, they don't correlate with any of these, they don't correlate with the terrestrial um, vegetation or the chemical weathering. So that must, I feel like they must be disconnected to some extent and that, um, maybe the, the, the rainfall is more governed by this global temperature as it's getting colder, it's getting drier, but it doesn't mean it's getting, the, but the wind might be strong. But. Well, the, uh, yes, and the, but it, the wind systems seem to connect to the freezing in of Antarctica. So, I mean, that's new, yeah? I mean, we only saw that in the last couple of years. And so I was confused by it. What does it mean for the monsoon? Uh, and so I, I'm not entirely sure what is monsoon driven and what is globally driven. Right. Uh, and looking at your records, I have the same feeling. It, it, it sort of looks like, okay, opposite from what Ramo suggested and so on. But nonetheless, it follows sort of global climate change. So I, if you'd asked me six years ago, I basically thought the monsoon controlled everything, that it was, that there was, you know, it, that it was in, it it ran all the tectonics of the Himalayas. It drove all the global climate cycles. Uh, I don't feel like that anymore. I feel like the monsoon is often having to change its intensity because it's being driven by the solid Earth, because it's being forced by the global climate changes. So I feel like it's. it's, it's I mean, it may because it's such a big system. It probably, you know, it has to play some role in the the global climate cycle, but I don't think it doesn't dominate in the way that I did used to wonder if it might. No, I think it's both ways. I mean, definitely the monsoon will have a global influence. There's no doubt about it. But but uh, the other way too, you know, if you freeze in both poles, you know, mm -hmm. that that may have had an influence on the monsoon. And so, so this whole idea, it's all tectonics. I mean, I quite like these new, more recent papers suggesting that it's the weathering of arc and ophiolite belts in the tropics that may be more important in the chemical weathering and that the Himalayas less so. Um, that, yeah, I, it, I mean, we haven't, the problem, we do have a weathering record or we'll soon have a chemical weathering record for the Bengal fan. The main problem with the Bengal fan is that we don't have a good seismic grid for that to estimate the volume so making a, a a volumetric weathering budget for the bengal fan will be harder it it ought to be possible but it's going to be harder but the indications are that i've seen from what christian has shown um is that the bang probably the bengal fan is moving in the same way that the indus is and that uh that I don't think it's the Bengal fan secretly driving the global climate in the background. I think no. Valier Galli might disagree with me about that. I would, uh, I would intervene a bit to say that uh, we tend to see either, either one, either white or black. But it's probably the tectonics and the climate right. together. So th this kind of work that uh, brings tectonics with climate is something that we we should do more. Yeah, but global climate or low latitude climate? Well, global, low latitude and tectonics. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> well, thanks, Peter. Thank you for coming. And don't forget to come back next week, guys. I will send out an email to anyone whose email I have. If I don't have your email, send it to me and I'll include you. Uh, I forget who's next week. I want to say it's Zhao Kai Xu from, from um, Qingdao. Just uh, two minutes. And uh, yeah, so come back next week. It'll, of course, be on the Eastern schedule, Schedule B. So the time and the host will be different. So you should check the width, the, either the email I send you or the... Um, or the, or the the website
the website is always correct. Thank you very much, Peter. Once again, our friend Yurik just popped in. Hello. There we go. We were just talking about your old work, our old work. Okay. So, so thank you, anyway. everybody. Thank you, everybody, for the thanks for coming attending, and we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye bye for now. Bye bye.